Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. We're going to get started here in just one moment. Cindy, are you ready? Thank you, Misty. Yes, and hello, everyone. We'd like to thank all of you for joining us today in HHQI's June 2018 Cardiovascular Learning Action Network event. And whether you're watching the recording or participating in the live event, we'd like to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to join us. Now, a few housekeeping mentions before we get started. As with all HHQI LAN events, this event is being recorded and it will be archived on the HHQI website under the cardiovascular tab. All lines are currently muted and they'll remain this way throughout the session. We ask that you please send all your questions through the Q&A feature on the right side of your screen. Now, if you're not seeing the Q&A feature or the chat feature, if you click on the appropriate icon in the upper right-hand side of your screen, that will activate the feature and you'll be able to send in your questions. If you are in the listen-only mode or if you're watching the archived recording and any questions that you have, we ask that you send those to HHQI info at HHQI at qualityinsight.org. We'll get to as many questions as we can on today's session. Because you all are one of our two Learning Action Networks at HHQI, we'd like to keep you apprised of what's going on since we last met. So a few announcements before we get started. First, very big, we would like to acknowledge the most recent Milestone 4 Achiever, be Healthy at Home from Buda, Texas. Now, this is the first agency who's reached Milestone 4 in the state of Texas, so we'd like to send a special congratulations to them for all their hard work. Milestone 4, for those of you that have achieved it, it's not an easy one. So that's a really big accomplishment, and we'd like to say thank you to them. Also, for those of you that are interested in learning more about the milestones and how to achieve Milestone 4 and continue on with the quality improvement efforts of the cardiovascular health of your patients, you can find that on the Cardiovascular Health tab or contact us, we'll be happy to work with you. Now, because most of you are quality improvement people like we are, um, just a few stats. We'd like to keep you abreast of these types of things. And HHQI recently crossed multiple milestones that were just beside ourselves, to be honest with you, about how excited we are about it. First, 6,120, that is the number of CMS reporting home health agencies that are currently participating in HHQI. And as of about a half an hour ago, we are two participants short of crossing the 21,000 participants at HHQI. Everyone on this call is probably one of those participants and we'd like to thank you for being one of the 21,000. Now, a couple more stats that most likely includes many of you on this call today. 69,000, that is the number of episodes that have been abstracted and entered into the Home Health Cardiovascular Data Registry. And this one still blows my socks. Over 500,000 contact hours have been awarded through HHQI University. So those are some stats. We're very pleased and we really do thank you for everything that you do to help us with this. The final stat I wanted to mention is about our little group here. We at the Cardiovascular Learning Action Network, that's all of us on this call. This is our 20th LAN event since it started three to four years ago. So I'd like to thank all of you for every time that you participate, you take the time out of your schedule. We would like to also definitely thank our presenters, our technical experts, everyone that helps us put this together. Now, as you know, anytime we offer CEs, we have a few formalities, so here we go. The objectives on today's event, we do hope that upon conclusion that you'll be able to differentiate the three common types of cholesterol, define clinical atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, or ASCVD. We hope that you'll be able to identify the four patient populations that benefit from statin therapy, describe how to integrate evidence-based medicine principles with patients who have clinical ASCVD, we hope you'll be able to state two non-pharmacologic options to supplement and manage statin therapy. Let's go home health, that works. And finally, we hope that you'll be able to explain two additional effects of statin therapy beyond cholesterol management. Now, today's offering of continuing education is pending 1.25 hours of approval from the Alabama State Nurses Association they are an accredited approver of the American Nursing Credentialing Center's Commission on Accreditation, or the ANCC. 
In order to receive the CE credit, participants must watch the 60-minute webinar, enroll in the corresponding course at HHQI University, and complete the evaluation, which will take about 15 minutes. The instructions are listed here in this hyperlink, and we'll review this again upon completion of today's webinar so that you can get the CEs as you need. Now, with this, I would like to go ahead and take a moment and introduce our featured experts today, Dr. Chelsea Leonard and Dr. Matthew Holland. Dr. Chelsea Leonard graduated from East Tennessee State University, Bill Gatton College of Pharmacy in May of 2015 and completed a postgraduate community re pharmacy residency at Stanford University McWhorter School of Pharmacy at Chad's Payless Pharmacy in Florence, Alabama. After completion of her residency, she became a clinical service coordinator at Chad's Payless Pharmacy and also serves as a clinical pharmacist at Singer River Healthcare. She has experience in chronic disease management, including hyperlipidemia, hypertension, and diabetes. Dr. Matthew Holland graduated from East Tennessee State University, Bill Gatton College of Pharmacy in May of 2017, and shortly thereafter began his community pharmacy residency at Stanford University. His practice site, Chad's Payless Pharmacy and Singer River Health Clinic, are located in Florence, Alabama. Throughout his residency, Dr. Holland has been able to participate in the management of patients' chronic conditions, such as dyslipidemia, hypertension, and diabetes, both in the community and the ambulatory care setting. With this, I will turn this over to you guys for your presentation, and I thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Cindy, for that introduction, and thank you for inviting us to be your guest speakers today. Um, as Cindy said, we've got a lot going on at our pharmacy. We provide a number of clinical services, including an AADE accredited diabetes education program, a collaborative chronic disease management with Singing River Healthcare. We do travel and routine immunizations, and we do biometric health screenings. And these are just to name a few of the services we provide here. If you all were on the presentation I did a few years ago, a lot of the information today may be a little bit repetitive to you, it might sound familiar, but I do hope that we can provide you with a good refresher and some new updates about statin therapy. We do not have anything to disclose in regards to this presentation. All right. According to the most recent data from the CDC, 71 million adults, or 33.5% of adults in the United States, have high LDL, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a few minutes. This number has actually decreased since the last time I talked to this group in 2016, when it was 37.1% of Americans with HDL, so, or with high LDL. So we must be doing something right. Having high cholesterol also increases one's risk twofold to develop heart disease, which is the leading cause of death of adults in the United States. Other risk factors for heart disease include diabetes, obesity, poor diet, physical inactivity, and excessive alcohol intake, some of which commonly go hand in hand with high cholesterol. Less than half of adults with high cholesterol actually receive treatment for it. This is important because of the fact that heart disease is so prevalent in America. As healthcare providers who commonly have contact with patients, we can have an impact on this number. As I mentioned previously, heart disease is the number one cause of death for adults in America. This map shows the prevalence of the disease. The darker colors indicate higher death rates, and this is why it's important to manage and treat high cholesterol. And the, where it's real dark down there in the southern states, that's where, that's where we are, and we have a lot of patients with high cholesterol and heart disease. What exactly is cholesterol? It's a waxy, fat-like substance that travels through the blood attached to proteins called lipoproteins. It's produced by the liver to help make hormones and vitamin D, and it helps digest fatty foods. It's also found in foods you eat, like eggs, cheese, and fatty meats. When your body has too much cholesterol, it can build up on the walls of your blood vessels, and these deposits are called plaques. You can see here in this photo that cholesterol, again, comes from many different sources, and then the photo on the right shows a picture of what a plaque can look like in the bloodstream. 
As your blood vessels build up plaque deposits over, the, over time, the insides of the vessels narrow and allow less blood to flow through your heart and to other organs. When plaque buildup totally blocks a coronary artery carrying blood to the heart, it can cause a heart attack. Another cause of a heart attack is when a plaque deposit bursts and releases a clot in the coronary artery. Angina is caused by a plaque partially blocking a coronary artery, which reduces blood flow to the heart and causes chest pain. Also, when cholesterol is high, the excess LDL begins to seep into the arteries. This can trigger an inflammatory response, which in turn speeds up the accumulation of cholesterol in the artery wall. This begins a continuous cycle of inflammation and cholesterol buildup. Eventually, like I mentioned, the cholesterol can harden into a plaque, which can then rupture and lead to blood clots that cause heart attacks and strokes. Many experts believe that inflammation is also linked to many diseases and conditions that affect the heart and brain. And Matt will talk to you all a little bit more about this the infl inflammatory process. So when a patient has their blood work done, the cholesterol panel will come back with a few different numbers. The most common numbers include the HDL, which is the good cholesterol. HDL absorbs the bad cholesterol, or the LDL, and takes it back to the liver to be flushed out of the body, which is how cholesterol can help digest fatty foods. Having higher levels of HDL can reduce the risk of heart disease and stroke. The ideal level for HDL is 40 or higher, and to increase HDL, patients can increase their intake of heart-healthy fats found in olive oil, fish, avocados, and increase their intake of high-fiber fruits like apples, pears, and prunes, just to name a few examples. LDL is the bad cholesterol. This makes up the majority of the body's cholesterol and is often the number that's the target of most medications. High levels of LDL can cause plaque buildup in the arteries that leads to heart disease and strokes. The ideal level is less than 100. And then triglycerides. We'll call these the ugly cholesterol. Triglycerides are a type of fat found in the blood, and they literally look like blobs of grease floating through the blood. These are really affected by eating fatty foods, refined sugars, and carbohydrates. And the ideal level of triglycerides is less than 150. If they're really high, they then become the main, or over 500, they then become the main target to treat with medication. And the total cholesterol is a combination of all of those numbers, HDL, LDL, and triglycerides, and the ideal level of total cholesterol is less than 200. The CDC recommends that all adults over 20 years old have a fasting lipid panel performed at least every five years although many providers choose to do this annually or more frequently if necessary. It's important that when the patient has their blood work done, they've been fasting for at least eight hours with no food or drink, except for maybe water and black coffee. If not, the results will be inaccurate and the sample may end up looking something like the photo shown here. This would probably be what it would look like if I went for a lab draw right after I ate a really big cheeseburger. If the patient has not been fasting and the results are inaccurate, this could potentially lead to unnecessary medications and treatment. The U.S. Preventative Services Task Force now recommends that all patients 40 and older with at least one of these risk factors, so high cholesterol, high blood pressure, diabetes, or if they're a smoker, should be screened to see if they need a statin, regardless of their cardiovascular disease history. Now, Matt is going to talk to you some more specifically about treatment recommendations and statin therapy. All right. Thank you, Dr. Leonard, for that introduction and getting us set up to talk about uh, some more in-depth information about statins and cholesterol. So we've heard about the numbers and what they mean. Now we're going to talk about how we apply these things with the evidence we now know to impact patients' lives. But before we get into all that, let's go over some basics. First, what is atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, or ASCVD? Um, cardiovascular, that tells us that it has something to do with the circulation, the circulatory system, our blood vessels, mainly our arteries and our heart. 
Um, atherosclerotic means it's regarding plaque building up in your arteries. Um, and this is not only related to your cholesterol levels, but to other risk factors as well that we'll talk about in just a moment. Um, some of these things, like acute coronary syndrome, is anything that results in a reduction of blood flow to the heart. So those are things like uh, myocardial infarction or heart attack or angina that Chelsea told you guys about just a moment ago. Strokes and TIAs, or also known as transient ischemic attacks, are loss of blood flow similarly to those um, lost to the heart, but these occur in the brain. Um, coronary and other revascularization procedures, like a coronary artery bypass graft, um, known as bypass surgeries, are done to restore blood flow to the heart. And anyone who has had that done is considered to have ASCVD as well. Peripheral artery disease is when plaques form in the lower extremities, and the most common symptom for that is leg pain, particularly when a patient is walking. Um, so these outcomes that are significantly studied here and looked at are heart attack, stroke, and death from some sort of cardiovascular disease. Um, these studies have let us know what puts someone at risk for these events occurring or recurring. Um, and we used to treat the numbers, but that is changing. So I ask you, why, why should we care what someone's LDL level is if they die of a massive heart attack? You know, I want to do all I can to prevent them from having that heart attack in the first place. And that means treating the whole person with the most up-to-date evidence I have. So because of that, we're making this shift from treating someone's numbers to reducing their risk. Uh, before we go on, I want you to just remember this one number, 50%. Uh, so this helps make this notion of treating with an evidence-based approach even more impactful when we look at the statistics. 50% of people who have a heart attack don't get the chance to have another one, aka they don't survive that heart attack. And 50% of people who have a heart attack, the heart attack itself was their first symptom because this is a, a silent disease. You don't know if your cholesterol is high. Uh, there are no real signs and symptoms. Um, so treating it and preventing it becomes very important. Uh, and also of note, when we treat someone who has ASCVD, uh, we're either treating it primarily or secondarily. Primary means that they're at risk for having a CV outcome and we're trying to keep it from happening. Secondary means that they've already had an event, like a heart attack or a stroke, and we wanna keep them from having another one. All of our treatments are about risk reduction. Uh, so we now know that it's not just someone's cholesterol that puts them at risk for having a cardiovascular event. And why high LDL levels and low LDL levels um, impact the formation of plaques. Oh, I spoke wrong. Why high LDL and low HDL levels impact the formation of plaques in our arteries. There are many other risk factors as well. And these include things like um, diabetes, obesity, especially central abdominal obesity, poor diet, not getting enough exercise, and alcoholism. How do we know these things are related to ASCVD? Well, clinical studies and evidence have provided us with the information we need, and we put this information together and help it shape the way we practice medicine. This is called evidence-based medicine. So we're going to pause from talking about only cholesterol and statins for just a minute and have a brief overview of evidence-based medicine. Um, I just wanted to show you this graph so that you could begin to get an idea of how we take scientific data and use it to shape the practice of medicine. At the very bottom, we have clinical experience, expert opinion, etc. And as we move up, the next three sections describe what we call observational studies. So, so these are just taking data that is out there and compiling it together to see if we can find a correlational relationship between things. For example, if someone has high LDL, does that put them at risk for developing ASCVD? But 
we can't assume that because things are correlated that there is a causal relationship. So like if we lower the LDL, then we lower the risk. We can't assume that. So uh, and while there's some truth to lowering LDL and reducing ASCVD risk, it's not the entire picture. So keep going up the pyramid with me. Um, the next set of studies are called experimental studies. So we take the evidence we have observed and we put it to the test here. We find out what is really going on and what are all the factors at play. And then we take the evidence we get from this and we compile them into large systematic reviews and meta-analyses. And it's also where we get our evidence-based guidelines from. Uh, so at the top of this pyramid, we have the most robust and applicable clinical data that we can use to practice medicine. Um, so this is also another very important, if not one of the most important points of evidence-based medicine. What do we really want to be able to do with the clinical knowledge that we actually have? Again, I ask you, why, why do I care what someone's LDL is if they die of a cardiovascular event? At the bottom, we have theoretical interventions. You know, it physiologically makes sense that if we do A, then B will improve. And surrogate markers, and those are things like um, LDL levels and blood pressure and, and other um, laboratory values like that. Um, as we move up the, the pyramid, we increase the, you know, the importance and the, the priority that we place on what we do in someone's life. Um, next, we have the quality of life. We want our patients to be able to enjoy the time that they have alive and get the most value out of it. Uh, but that decreasing morbidity means we're reducing the chance of a disease developing or being exacerbated. And most important of all is mortality reduction. This helps people live longer. The evidence that impacts mortality usually takes precedent over interventions that only impact quality of life and morbidity, although there are always exceptions to the rule. So let's apply a little bit of what we've learned so far. There is an excellent tool out there called an ASCVD risk calculator. And what it does, it compiles all of the surrogate markers and risk factors that have been linked to the development of ASCVD or having an ASCVD outcome. Uh, when we put in a patient's information, we are given a number in percent that lets us know what their chances of developing ASCVD over 10 years uh, is. And for some groups, it will provide an overall lifetime risk as well. And then we actually use this number to steer the course of pharmacotherapy. And we'll talk about it in just a moment as we go over the guidelines. And just to make you all aware, um, HHQI has changed their measure as well. As you can see, uh, you guys are no longer focusing solely on lowering LDL levels, uh, but you're seeing if a patient is taking a statin medication. Um, as we'll learn in the next few slides, statins are the only cholesterol medicine that can reduce mortality in patients who have or who are at risk with, uh, for developing ASCVD. So we're looking at the number of patients um, who are on a statin or have a reason to not be on a statin and comparing that to the number of patients who need to be on one. They either have ASCVD or they have a, high, um, a diagnosis of high cholesterol. So next we're gonna take kind of all this information, uh, our principles of what is cholesterol, uh, what is ASCVD, what is evidence-based medicine, and, and see how it all comes together to develop the treatment guidelines. Um, and just a disclaimer, none of these recommendations or modifications to therapy can be implemented without first consulting with and gaining the approval from a licensed medical practitioner under whom the patient is receiving care. Okay, so the statin benefit groups are described in the most current clinical guidelines we have for treating cholesterol. Uh, these four groups, um, 
qualifier for what is termed high intensity statin therapy, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, now, this is for uh, patients who are over 21 years of age, and our first group is anyone who has clinical ASCVD. Uh, remember that ASCVD is there's a medical condition in this person where there is plaque buildup in one or more parts of the circulatory system. And of note, um, anyone who is over 75 or who is unable to tolerate a high intensity statin, uh, they are actually eligible to step down and have what's called a moderate intensity statin as well. Our second group is anyone who's found to have a very elevated LDL level, which would be over 190. Um, and that's all there is to say about that group. You know, we know that L high LDL levels do put a patient at risk for that. Uh, the third group uh, is patients with diabetes uh, who don't have ASCVD and who are 40 to 75 years old and their 10-year ASCVD risk is equal to or greater than 7.5%, and their LDL is approximately 70 to 189. If their risk is less than 7.5, you could consider doing a moderate intensity statin over a high intensity statin. And our fourth group are people who don't have uh, ASCVD or diabetes, they're in the same age group, 40 to 75, and their LDL is below 190, but their 10-year risk um, is equal to or greater than 7.5, and the guidelines there uh, say um, it should be a discussion with the patient and the provider, um, but uh, they could either get a moderate or a high-intensity statin. Um, and not to confuse you, but this isn't the entire picture. Sometimes a physician may decide to treat someone who doesn't fit into any of these groups. But for example, they may have a, a family history, a strong family history of ASCVD. And that's just one example of the reasons they may want to treat someone who doesn't fall into these benefit groups. So here's a list of our most common statin medications. And we're going to talk about them more in a little more detail in just a second, but I wanted to just give you this reference slide so that you can remember what they are and um, you can associate a brand name with the generic name of a medication. Um, this slide is to say that we like statins a lot. They work. Our, our liver makes our cholesterol, and these medications block a certain protein that is needed in order to do so. They're potent medications. They have been shown to have the most impact on lowering LDL and total cholesterol levels. <clears throat> they help save lives. They reduce mortality in patients um, who we are treating you know, for both primary and secondary prevention and they help save lives by doing more than lowering LDL. And this, folks, this is the moment we've all been waiting for. I hope it's all starting to come together now like a puzzle for you guys. Um, evidence has shown that statins can impact mortality not only by lowering LDL, but by other means as well. And this is why we can't simply say that treating a number will reduce someone's risk. The practice of medicine, no matter what our role is on the healthcare team, requires looking at the whole patient and taking an evidence-based, patient-centered approach to their care. So these other effects of statins are also known as the pleiotropic effects of statins. So uh, statins have been shown to be able to stabilize the plaques that a person may already have, and it also helps prevent those plaques from rupturing and causing a blockage. Remember uh, from the slide at the beginning that showed the uh, blood vessel that had the plaque form in it and reducing blood flow, you know, if that were to rupture and occlude the vessel completely, um, that blockage would mean loss of blood flow, loss of uh, oxygen to that tissue and result in potential death of the tissue that's 
supplied by that artery. Um, these statins also uh, decrease inflammation that results from the buildup of cholesterol in the arterial wall. And they also keep your blood from clotting up on and around plaques that have formed. So how do they work? We know they work in the liver, um, but um, this picture shows us uh, the mechanism of action of a statin. And as you can see, um, acetyl-CoA is turned into HMG-CoA. And what statins do is they block an enzyme called HMG-CoA reductase, which turns HMG-CoA into mevalonate. And then by blocking that, you can see the chain is kind of cut off and the cycle isn't able to proceed forward. So in addition to not being able to make um, cholesterol, we also don't make these things called prenylated proteins. And these prenylated proteins have been associated with things like vessel constriction, plaque formation, narrowing of the arteries, inflammatory processes, and oxidization, excuse me. Um, so by blocking that process, we not only reduce our cholesterol levels, but we get all these other benefits as well that help reduce someone's cardiovascular risk. All right, this huge picture here is a summary of all that we've talked about so far and more. Um, it's the treatment algorithm that is published in the guidelines. And I don't want to spend any time going over it in great detail. Um, in the slides we've just covered, I've pulled out what the most important things we think are from this chart. Uh, but now you will have this um, for your reference, all of it in one location uh, for, your, um, for your records. So um, we talked about statin intensity, you know, when we talk about picking out the statin benefit groups and who needs a statin, uh, we mentioned high intensity and moderate intensity, and there's actually even a third category called uh, lower intensity statins as well. Um, the intensity of a statin is just a correlation of how, it, how effectively it can lower your LDL levels. Um, as you can see, we only have two options for high intensity statins. Uh, we see in the pharmacy all the time patients who are on a moderate intensity statin who really qualify for a high intensity statin. Um, now, sometimes our findings result in a necessary change in therapy for the patient, um, but sometimes we also learn that a patient is on a moderate intensity statin or a low intensity statin because they are intolerant for some reason to a uh, high intensity stat. And here's another slide for your reference. Um, some of these drug-drug uh, interactions are important to know, uh, like the azole fungals and calcium channel blockers, they impact the way that our body breaks down the statins. They keep it from breaking down the statin fast enough, and it puts the patient at having um, at risk for having statin-related adverse drug reactions. And sometimes the statins will affect other drugs as well. For example, uh, warfarin, a common blood thinner, needs to be broken down by the body, but statins keep this from happening as fast as it should. So the warfarin uh, levels in a person may rise to the point that it puts the patient at an increased risk for a bleed. Um, now, being on one or more of these medications is not a reason to, to not take a statin. Uh, but it's good to be aware of the potential risk for adverse drug reactions. And also, of an important note, statins are absolutely contraindicated in pregnant patients. Women who are of childbearing age should be made aware of this in the event that they become or try to become pregnant. So the rule of thumb is to take statins in the evening or at bedtime. And this is because your liver works at night 
uh, while you sleep to make cholesterol. So doing so um, will help the medicine work a little better. But uh, torvastatin, rosuvastatin, and pitavastatin are longer lasting statins that can be taken any time during the day. And lovastatin should be taken with food. The food helps it become absorbed faster and uh, more easily uh, so that you get the benefit from the medicine. And then some of the most common side effects are what's called myalgias, and that just means muscle pain. A lot of times patients who start satin therapy will notice they have cramps or pain or weakness in kind of generalized areas of their, their musculature. Uh, we know that women have a higher risk for developing these symptoms, and other risk factors include older patients, people who are have a smaller body frame, uh, they have multiple diseases, um, they abuse alcohol, and they have medication use, i.e. they are taking a medicine that may have a risk of increasing the statin level, like those we just talked about on the previous slide. Most of the times, uh, those myalgias can be managed, but uh, to make you aware, uh, sometimes things can progress to a point where something has to be done. Uh, there is a rare but serious syndrome known as rhabdomyolysis that can develop. Uh, so the statins can cause muscle injury and death, and these muscle contents are then as broken down and released in the bloodstream, and those little particles that are released can wreak some havoc on the body, especially in the kidneys, and can result in kidney failure. Um, so. It's kind of hard to pinpoint these symptoms. Uh, there is what's known as the classic triad, which is pain in the shoulders, thighs, and lower back, um, having extreme muscle weakness, and having difficulty moving your muscles, and dark red or brown urine, or decreased urination. And that ties into uh, the effects that these particles can have on the kidneys. And you can see there's a myriad of other signs and symptoms that come along with this. Uh, some of them are kind of uh, general and could be, you know, kind of anything like pain, nausea, vomiting, you know. So you don't always want to assume that that's what's going on, but it's nice to be aware of uh, what this would look like and how you could treat it because it does require immediate medical care. So luckily, uh, more often than not, if someone's going to have a side effect from a statin, it's just going to be some um, mild generalized muscle pain. And instead of just taking them off the statin, we know that statins work and they help people who have ASCVD live longer. So we want them to be able to stay on the statin. So we've got some ways that we can manage this. There's the alternate day dosing. Uh, this is found in, they've only studied in atorvastatin so far. It's found to be effective, so they would just take the medication every other day instead of every, every day. Um, as far as the other statins, we're not really sure yet. It hasn't been verified with the evidence we have. But uh, we can consider doing it with the statins who have long half-lives that we've mentioned before. Um, another option is to lower or change the statin. Um, it's also, um, one thing we didn't talk about is some statins are considered water soluble and some are considered fat soluble. And there's this theory that uh, water soluble statins have a less chance of penetrating the muscle and causing muscle damage and resulting in muscle pain. Um, and so changing to one of those statins could be an option. And the water-soluble statins we have available are rosuvastatin and pravastatin. It's not guaranteed to work. It's still being studied, but it's an option to try when, you know, everything else may have failed. <clears throat> A couple of other options we have are supplementing uh, coenzyme Q10. Um, it has been shown to help reduce some muscle symptoms 
from statin-related uh, myalgias. Uh, we would dose that at 300 milligrams a day. It's a fairly low-risk medication. Uh, it's worth a shot, but one thing to consider is it shouldn't be taken in patients with warfarin. Another option we have is vitamin D. Vitamin D plays an important role in our bodies, doing things like helping our cells grow and reducing inflammation and helps our immune system function as well. Um, we're still not really sure how supplementing vitamin D levels helps reduce myalgias, but there is some evidence out there. And testing for low vitamin D can be kind of expensive. So um, a lot of times patients will be put on a vitamin D supplement regardless of the fact that they've had a lab drawn to check their vitamin D level. And while it's a good option to have, again, we need more evidence out there to confirm the role that vitamin D has in helping someone's side effects. Um, so we've talked about all the medications, uh, but even as good as statins are, there's no such thing as a miracle pill. Lifestyle modifications are and will continue to be a mainstay of therapy for not only cardiovascular disease, but a number of other diseases as well. Um, lifestyle modifications are recommended for all patients um, and to, to be done before medications are started. Um, a lot of times, They'll want to try these lifestyle modifications for at least six months before a medicine is added. And if a medicine is still needed at the end of that period, uh, these lifestyle modifications should not be done away with. You know, there's nothing that's going to replace a good diet and a good exercise program. Um, so here are the lifestyle modifications uh, to consider. And these are the answer to the risk factors. So I like to think of it like the, the risk factors are like the seven deadly sins and our lifestyle modifications are the seven virtues, even though there's not seven of them, but you get what I mean. Um, so we wanna eat a heart healthy diet that's low in fat and high in fiber. And the American Heart Association, Association recommends uh, a diet that's low in sodium and saturated fat. Uh, recommend that their, your patients get regular exercise at least 40 minutes, three to four times per week. It's been shown to reduce uh, total cholesterol, triglycerides, LDL cholesterol, as well as boost uh, good cholesterol. And it helps also regulate their sugar levels as well. Um, people need to avoid the use of tobacco products, uh, not just cigarettes, but any form of tobacco or nicotine has uh, been associated with uh, serious negative effects on the cardiovascular system. And always we want patients to maintain a healthy weight through their diet and exercise program. So that concludes my part of this presentation. I'm going to now turn it back over to Dr. Leonard, and she's going to talk to you guys about how to use a community pharmacy. All right, thank you, Matt. Um, I know that was a lot of information. Sometimes this stuff is, is difficult to comprehend and unless you see it a ton, it's, you've got to keep looking at it to really familiarize yourself with this. But I will say if you ever have any questions or concerns about medications that your patients are taking or want to talk to someone about starting an over-the-counter supplement to help with those side effects like Matt was talking about, uh, I would suggest that you contact your local pharmacist. I can pretty much guarantee you that they'll be happy to help you, but if they're not, you can give me a call or Matt a call, and we will definitely be glad to help. Your pharmacist can help you identify adherence issues that may be a concern. As you all know, medications can only be affected, effective if they are taken correctly. And most of the adherence issues that I've seen have been because of cost. So your pharmacist might be able to help you identify cheaper alternatives and make recommendations to the prescriber of the medication. Many patients also have trouble if they have a lot of medication to take, and most of our patients here do. 
A pharmacist might be able to make recommendations to streamline their therapy and decrease the number of meds that they are taking. Forgetfulness is another big reason for adherence issues. I know sometimes I forget to take my multi multivitamin, so I can imagine how difficult it is to keep up with several meds. I usually tell patients to keep their medications where they will see them every day, as long as they don't keep them in the bathroom, because heat and moisture is not good for the medication. Or if a patient is tech savvy, I'll encourage them to set an alarm on their phone. Some pharmacies might even package medications for you to help make them easier to deal with. And if a patient is experiencing side effects, they might stop taking the medications. And pharmacists can help you identify side effects and ways to alleviate them if possible. Like Matt mentioned, with, with statins specifically, muscle cramps is a common reason for adherence issues with statins. So he said that this could, these could be reduced by taking the medication with food or taking it at a different time of day. Um, and that's, that's common with many medications. Sometimes the dosage might be too high and causing side effects. So pharmacists can, can usually look at a patient's profile and, and maybe be able to figure out what's going on just by that and they can help you communicate with the prescriber to make recommendations for the therapy. And then again, they can also recommend over-the-counter agents, such as CoQ10 for muscle cramps to help with side effects. Pharmacists can also help you identify drug interactions and again, communicate with the prescriber if an action needs to be taken. Um, can also determine if the interactions can be prevented if the medications are dosed at separate times. In some pharmacies, they're also able to do point-of-care testing. So many pharmacists have the capability to check cholesterol in the pharmacy, and they can get the results in about five minutes and make recommendations for cholesterol management. I encourage you to find a pharmacist you trust and communicate with them regularly as they can be great resources for you and your patients. And again, our disclaimer, none of these recommendations or modifications can be implemented without first consulting with the prescriber and making sure that this is okay with them. We will be taking questions in a little bit, but please feel free to reach out to us if you have any additional questions that may arise after this presentation. And uh, before I turn it back over to Cindy, I do want to point out some typos that we saw during the presentation on the slide that had the medications listed out with their brand and generic names. In that very first box for Lipitor, the generic name is actually Atorvastatin and not Rosuvastatin. And we can, we can fix these slides and have them uh, repost them if possible. And then there's another typo on slide 18 that's showing the um, risk factors for, uh, well, what did it say? I can't remember which one it was. But it, anyway, it said high LDL and low LDL, but it was supposed to be low HDL. Low HDL can be a risk factor for heart disease. So those were, those were two typos we definitely want to get fixed and make sure that you all, that you know about that. So now we will be sending the ball back over to Cindy and we'll do a Q&A in just a moment. Well, thanks, Chelsea and Matt. I really appreciate your time on that. And thanks for addressing the typos. We've all done presentations and we have those. For those of you that have already downloaded the slides, we will make the changes to these typos and upload the uh, corrected version later today, maybe even in the next few minutes. So um, look back for those. And thank you for catching those. We appreciate that. Now, a few questions that have come in, uh, we'll ask a few and then go through a few patient resources and then I want to continue to encourage everybody to send as many questions in as you have because we do want to uh, get to as many as we can. Now, I'll start with the most recent one first and it's um, how long after a statin med is discontinued is it still effective, such as those times when they are DC'd on a hospice patient? Okay, that is a great question and, you know, it's really going to depend on the half-life of the medication, which is just um, a measure of how long the medicine stays in the body. Um, for those that have longer half-lives, like 
uh, torvastatin and rosuvastatin, you know, it may stay in their body for a couple of days or even up to a week or so. Uh, but something to consider here, um, at this point in, the, uh, in a patient's life, if they're on hospice and uh, they may have a history of ASCVD or they may have another reason to be on a statin, but uh, at this point when they are a hospice patient, uh, that can take precedence and, you know, you, it's really a, a debate then. It's not clear cut who needs to still be on a statin at that point. And so, um, you know, are they more likely to pass away from complications with the disease that has them on hospice care in the first place? Or um, are they going to pass away from a cardiovascular event? So at that point, uh, the risk versus benefits are really put into consideration as to who needs to be on a statin. And I hope that answers the question and provides a little insight for you guys. I think it does. Thank you. For the person who asked the question, if you have a follow-up question, feel free to put it in. In the meantime, I'll ask another question that was, um, well, what can we do? I think you covered this. this. A couple questions came in, I think, before the content was covered. So I'll just ask, it was, what can we do about lead cramps with statins that are not rhabdo? So that is, um, I think you put uh, quite a few good resources out there. And I don't know about the rest of you in the audience, but I felt these slides are actually good references. Um, there are a lot of good information on there for us to keep by our, as we're working as clinicians. Uh, another one that I did watch this one come in just before you covered it, so I think you have it. Uh, could you review the high-intensity statin versus the moderately intensive statin? And I think um, slide 31 covers that one as well. Um, it, for those of you who ask these questions, if they are not answered in the way, if the slide did not answer it, let me know. We want to definitely get you the answer. Uh, there was another question that came in, and then we'll move on to a few more slides. Uh, what is your recommendation for a diabetic patient in both cases, 10-year ASCVD risk below or above 7.5% when the patient's LDL is below 70 and already taking a low-intensity statin, especially if the LDL is significantly less than 70 and already on a low-intensity statin? That is a very good question as well, and actually, if you print out the entire guidelines, which I don't recommend anyone doing because it's, <laughs> it's terribly long and boring, um, but hidden somewhere in the depths of all that text, there is a, a statement that says at a point when a patient who requires a statin, when their LDL falls below a certain point, and I believe if I'm remembering correctly, 40, and I will follow up on that to verify, uh, when it falls below 40, you can consider taking them off the statin altogether. Um, you know, these guidelines have provided a lot of great insight and have helped us shape our practice of medicine uh, into what it is, but, you know, nothing's perfect, unfortunately. Um, so for this particular patient, um, for both of them, actually, um, I would want to know, are they smoking? Uh, what are their other comorbidities? Uh, what's their life expectancy? Um, what can we really benefit by putting them on a statin at this point? You know, and um, that kind of decision has to be come to by not only the physician, but the patient and perhaps their caregiver as well. Um, I would say I like to err on the side of caution and recommend that as long as someone can be on a statin um, and they are a candidate for it to, to stay on it um, so that they could receive any benefits that the statin is going to provide, even if that means um, staying on a low intensity statin. Well, thank you for that. And I think that You've highlighted how this can turn into, it's not as simple as treating, as you said in the beginning, a number. There are a lot of comorbidities and a lot of different variables that need to be taken into consideration when deciding what goes on, and that is a group decision. The pharmacist, the physician, 
and those of you that are the clinicians in the home have an insight as to what's going on with the family, the adherence issues, and all the different potential obstacles as to why the patient may not be adhering to this medication regime, and that's what it, it takes a community to help lower the cholesterol. So thank you for that. We'll go ahead and move through a few uh, resources for those of you that are in the clinical setting. Um, HHQI has a couple of different resources we wanted to point out that are available to you if this is an area that you're wanting to involve further. Cardiovascular Health Part 2 Best Practice Intervention Packages focuses on cholesterol management and smoking cessation, and as noted, it is for clinician and agency leadership, and it is both available in English and in Spanish. Now, there's a multiple patient tools, but a few we wanted to point out. Take control of your cholesterol is a nice tool that is available in both English and Spanish. And then the My Healthy Heart Workbook, you can see the languages there that it's been translated into and it is available to be downloaded so that your patients can use it and have a reference guide for when you're not in the home helping them understand this. They can also take that to the physician's office. Additional HHQI resources include this fax form. Remember, the ABCS that we talk about aspirin, blood pressure, cholesterol, cardiac rehab, and smoking cessation, this is not new and it's not home health specific. This is something that the entire healthcare community in this country is focusing on. Unusual, I know, usually it's something that home health is focusing on and trying to help get the rest of the people in the healthcare community to participate in. That's not the case here. So using this fax form, it's available to you if it makes it easier to contact your physicians on something like this or your uh, prescriber. That also goes into play, as Matt mentioned, that the HHDDR, the Home Health Cardiovascular Data Registry cholesterol measure was changed in the past year from a LDL-focused measure to a statin-focused measure. And the reason for that, the same thing. HHQI and home health were not standing alone. What we have done is we take the measures that the physicians are held responsible for both monetarily encouraged and penalized, and we've incorporated those into the home health setting. So these are the same measures that your physicians, that you're working with in your community, are focusing on. And so um, thank you for noticing that and bringing that out um, to everyone's attention, Matt. We appreciate that. A couple more resources that are available to everyone are the university courses, such as the one you could take with this. Now, Dr. Leonard did present cholesterol management, the good, the bad, and the ugly, a fantastic presentation a few years ago, and that is available. It's still accredited for contact hour or nursing contact hour CEs. There's another one called lifestyle management for the cardiovascular health. This is a great one, especially for your clinicians who are working with patients who maybe are not able to, um, maybe they're not able to uh, handle a statin, or maybe they need something in addition to the statin, or they're not quite there yet. Finally, partnering with patients to make noncompliance a thing of the past, five conversational skills that can make it happen. This is a great course, not only for statins, but anything that has to do with adherence and adherence issues. It just gives a lot of good tips and reminders to the clinicians who are in the field working with the patients. Now let's talk about the continuing education for those of you that are wanting your nursing CEs. There is a step-by-step -step flyer on this link. In step three, you can select cardiovascular health course catalog. That course catalog will bring up all the courses pertaining to cardiovascular health, and you can select and follow the instructions from there. One thing we request is that if you are unsure of your HHQI university username, please send us an email at hhqiqualityinsights.org so that we can obtain that username for you and keep it to one account per person. Because these CEs are pertaining to professional licensures, we must only keep one account per person. You can create multiple accounts, but we'll need to go in there and join them. So if you're unsure of your username, just contact us. We're happy to get that for you. Now, finally, we are closing in on the top of the hour, and I don't see that any additional questions have come in. But if you are listening to this as an archived recording, or if you would like additional questions come up, make sure to contact us at HHQI. The website is here on the slide. And I have been notified that the corrected slides have been posted. So if you have downloaded the slides, we ask that you go back and download the ones that are now currently posted on the same place where you downloaded them before. That way you can have the updated ones. Never know when you're going to look back at those and want to know some specific thing and that'll catch your eye. 
I'd like to say the upcoming date, every third Thursday at 2 o'clock Eastern, you know HHQI's got something going on. July, third Thursday will be July 19th, and that is for the underserved population, and the content will be strategies to care for patients in rural settings. August will be live chat month, and then that brings us back around to September 20th, the third Thursday in September, which will be the Cardio LAN event again. That is our next event. And at this point, we're going to be discussing the impact of air quality on our patients, not only with respiratory illnesses, but with cardiovascular. Our guest experts will be from the CDC and the EPA, so we encourage you to join us for that one as well. That will be September 20th. So with that, we would like to thank Dr. Leonard and Dr. Holland for their time, their expertise, and for joining us today. For all of you who have already registered to continue on with your milestones, we thank you for that. We'll be in touch with you shortly. And if you have any questions, please contact us at HHQI, and we'll be glad to help you. Thank you, everybody, and have a great day. Thank you.